I want to highlight some aspects of the commentary by Bruce Walke and Kathy Fredericks. And uh, echoing also upon some of the words I read from Walter Brueggemann in last week's session, that God had called forth a people for himself to break with the norms of the world, the world of Southern Mesopotamia, uh, the latter years of the Sumerian civilization, which is one of the great civilizations of Southern Mesopotamia uh, throughout the early Bronze Age during the third millennium BC, and as I mentioned, this was not the original homeland of the ancestors of Terra, Abram, Sarah, and company, but they had originally come from those areas of Upper Mesopotamia, uh, sometimes referred to as Aram Naharayan, the Aramean region of the two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, so what we often refer to as Upper Mesopotamia, which today is Northern Iraq, uh, Northeastern Syria, and southernmost uh, southeastern corner of modern day Turkey. The genealogy, of course, at, at chapter 11 ends with uh, this segment uh, highlighting Terah as the father of Abram. And of course, this links together the genealogy of chapter 11, uh, the period between Noah and the new world of what God is fashioning in the midst of a decadent world of ancient Mesopotamia. Terah becomes, uh, again, this uh, last generation of this family in their polytheistic, uh, multi-god worshiping world, uh, the last of a generation uh, whose center is Mesopotamia. They had somewhere during that third millennium BC migrated down to the southern region, settled in Ur of the Chaldees. Again, as of course most commentaries will highlight, the term Chaldean or Chaldees is a reference to later uh, uh, Aramean stock of people like Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon who conquered Jerusalem. Uh, he is a Chaldean. Uh, and so his background is also uh, going back many generations uh, from us upper Mesopotamia. And again, the area around Babylon is like in the, in the middle of the region of the ancient Akkadian culture. But in the, in the account as uh, you've translated in your work in the Hebrew text for this week, the movement is out of Southern Mesopotamia, to head to a land of their forefathers initially to the area around Haran. Now Haran, again, is just over into modern day Turkey, just across the border from uh, uh, northern, northern Syria today, uh, as is highlighted in your commentary by Walki, Tel El Hakayar, those this uh, Ur of the Chaldeans, and then in modern day San Liorfa is the mound of ancient Haran. Uh, we'll also be uh, noting that uh, there's Haran is also the name of one of the family members of the biblical patriarchs, but they're gonna journey out of Abraham on the call of God while they're in Mesopotamia in the Northern region. Terra, interesting, one of the facets that Walkie highlights is that both Ur and Haran were centers for the worship of the moon god Sin. Now, totally unconnected with our word Sin, Sin, as it would be pronounced in ancient Kadian, was a god associated with the moon. They had, of course, deities for sun, moon, uh, all of the stars. Each of the stars was believed to be in ancient uh, astral religion. Uh, to be simply emanations from an individual God, a light shining forth from the gods of the heavens upon the earth. Uh, so the sun, uh, which is known as uh, either Utu in the Sumerian language or Shamash in the Mesopotamian language, uh, also viewed as a deity. But interesting enough that uh, at both Ur and at Haran, uh, the moon god, Sing, 
was worshipped uh, as, again, one among many, but the patron deity. Each city of ancient Mesopotamia had a what we call a, a hierarchy of a pantheon of deities. Uh, an upper deity who would often, of course, have a female counterpart and uh, a collection of deities around. But one deity was typically viewed as the patron deity, like Marduk was for the city of Babylon, like Ashur was for the Assyrians, particularly in the city of Nineveh. Each of these cities had their patron deity. And again, the moon god Sin was the patron deity of the city of Haran. Some have suggested that that's perhaps why they stopped at Haran as Terah taking his family along. This is not viewed as the, the call of God, but they had made this journey uh, to another center where their favorite deity, perhaps in the family culture of ancient Mesopotamia, was also worshiped. But of course, as we read, that is where Para dies. And from that point in chapter 12, we get the call of God upon Abraham and this ultimate purpose of being a blessing to the nation. I want to just uh, highlight a couple of excerpts out of the commentary uh, by Waltke and Fredericks. Similar to uh, the reading uh, I shared and is in the PowerPoint uh, on the Abraham and uh, history writing, what he says on the bottom of page 203, that God's call upon Abram and Sarah Against the hopelessness, God's sovereign call of Abraham offers a bright hope. Indeed, Sarah's sterility emphasizes the fact that God's grace is beyond human imagination. She will bear children not by simple natural generation, but by a supernatural life that faith engenders. Through this childless couple, God will bring a new humanity that is born not out of the will of the husband, but out of the will of God. You read, of course, in the uh, continuing narrative that you'll be translating over several weeks. And, and through that narrative, of course, we'll look at a, a couple of the major covenant passages, like in chapter 15 and chapter 17. Uh, even through those special uh, divine interventions into the life of this patriarchal family, there's still not the fulfillment of the promise of a nation through a child of this couple. It will be not at age 75, not at age 85, not at age 90. That, that promise of fulfillment of a son that would come forth uh, in the child Isaac, born of Abraham and Sarah uh, later on in the narrative. After these covenant passages have highlighted, Abraham is in the land pursuing God's call, not fully understanding how this is going to happen. And, and of course, the Isaac's name reflecting upon Sarah's laughing and Abraham as well will laugh at the idea that, you know, uh, in, at age 99, you know, he could, he could conceive a child, and likewise, the, the barrenness of Sarah. On page 202, by the, the previous page was 201, talks about the various scenes that follow through the plot. One of the projects that you'll be doing in uh, uh, preparation for your final paper uh, by the way, you'll need to be looking at choosing a passage for your exegetical final paper. And that, uh, that passage, which should be, again, we'll talk about it more in a few moments, uh, a definable pericope, a definable uh, portion of text, with a beginning and an end. Uh, we're looking at a literary analysis. Uh, at the top of page 202 in this uh, Commentary by um, Dr. Waltke talks about 
the five scenes of the particular act as he breaks down again the commentary into the various uh, life acts of the family of Abram and Sarah. That again in this portion, chapters 12 through 15, focus on the on the land and God's gift of the land eventually, though it will be several hundred years later. Now that Abraham sets out for this land. So he does, as he calls it, a literary analysis of book six of the book of Genesis. And this is book six, act one, as he calls it. And so what he gives you in that paragraph is a literary analysis, a plot analysis of this portion of the biblical text in chapters 12 through 15. And this is the kind of thing I'll be wanting for you to do with your particular. Uh, exegetical passage that you'll be choosing over the next couple of weeks. I'll be sending forth an email also to you this week, highlighting some of the aspects, but begin looking at some of the handouts that are available in the various uh, content areas of the units of uh, one through eight in the, this. And then finally, the characterization study is unit nine, uh, which is due after the uh, fall break period. So. Uh, literary analysis of your passage will be one of the goals uh, in your ultimate project of a full exegetical analysis of one of the biblical passages in chapters 12 to 36. Break at that point.